Welcome back to the show, everybody. Check out these headlines here. Who is the largest investor in crypto? We're going to share that with you today. We got RippleNet, BRICS Coalition, looking to develop their own SDR. And could the IMF's ESDR equal XRP? You're going to see some evidence, I believe, of that today with a new report from the BIS that's out right now. Somebody roll that beautiful intro. Digital Perspectives with Brad Kimes. Come on in. Welcome back to the show, everybody. You can follow me on Twitter at Dig Perspectives at the top of the screen. Everything that we're talking about here today, $953 billion market cap for crypto. We're off by 2.9% this morning. Good morning. It's July 11th, 2022. By the way, quick reminder, we got breaking news from the SEC versus Ripple case. SEC is looking to make secret some of their information from expert witnesses. We will get into that shortly here. Right now, Bitcoin, 20500 plus Ethereum. Ethereum 1100 plus and XRP at the number seven spot at 32 cents. Ladies and gentlemen, let's take a look at it. We're off by 3.71% in the 24 hour. We're ranging between 32 and 34 cents. We'll keep an eye on it. This morning, I tell you about Glint Pay. I love working with them, but I love being a customer even more. I'm about to top off my Glint Pay card and add some more gold to hedge the inflation that we're all feeling. And I wanted to play you this clip too, because, you know, I feel like things Things like this are a real possibility. We're going to hear from Stansberry Research, Daniela Cambone, and David Morgan, who we're going to hear from again before we get out of here. But take a listen to this 30-second clip here. The idea that you have money in the bank, everyone takes for granted, but they don't read the fine print to realize they're an unsecured creditor. I'm talking about the United States now. An unsecured creditor to the bank, and it's really the bank's money, believe it or not. And what that means in a banking crisis, and let's say that there is a bail in, then they have the right legally to take what you consider to be your money. Now, that's a huge problem for me. And, you know, that's why I love Glint Pay. And I'm sharing this because, you know, with inflation getting so high, we've always had conversations here. Could the banks turn at some point after they get all the digital money released in the world and go to a negative interest rate, which really means a bail in? Right. If you don't understand that, that means that if there was a three percent negative interest rate imposed and you had one hundred dollars in the bank, you now have ninety seven dollars. That does not a solution make for me. Now, I do believe it is wise to have some liquid cash on hand in case we experience what David Morgan goes on to say in that clip there, which you don't get to hear, which is some kind of cyber attack, which is Russia has threatened to do to the banking system in the United States as retaliation for swift sanctions and things of that nature. So I, f I think it's good to have some cash on hand, but it's also good for me to have some gold on my card and my app with Glint Pay to hedge the inflation that's happening here. And that's how I do it. You can check it out with the link underneath the video. By the way, it's going on all around the world here. The Japanese yen falls to a 24 year low against a dollar and let us not forget it has been said that it's possible Evergrande is backing Tether to a degree or is a part tied into the backing of Tether and I just played for you over the weekend and last week uh, the CTO of Tether acknowledging that they do not use commercial paper to back their, their uh, Tether peg. They do not use U.S. Treasuries to back their Tether peg. And the Tether itself is not pegged to the dollar, but pegged to their own portfolio. And they do not use an outside firm to manage their holdings and reserves. That spells Huge problems coming here for Tether and I believe the crypto space because Tether currently right now is sitting in the neighborhood of $66 billion market cap. Imagine that getting wiped out in crypto and what it would do to prices in this space. I tell you, I'm keeping some dry powder in case such an event takes place. Now, who is 
the biggest investor in crypto. Well, it's Digital Currency Group. Shout out to Linda P. Jones for this clip and shout out to Reggie Middleton, who is really the founder of Verticium, I believe, in the very token. And I believe he has been subject to bullying by the FCC as well, to say the least. I want to set this clip up for you so you can hear this important shot from this. One second. Opinion, Reggie. When you name people like BlackRock and Fidelity and the like, do you think that they got involved in this, especially with the convertible modes, because they are trying to corner the crypto market because they all want to be involved in it and put everybody else out of business? Well, I don't know if they want to put anything outside of business, but there is one inexpensive way of uh, buying a business. I, exactly. That's what I mean. Yeah. They want. Yeah. They want. They want to be the sole uh, provider determinant and everything in the crypto space. And that's the way I see it with uh, yeah. with these people involved in it and stuff like that, you know? I actually think that's a done deal already. Um, yeah. You, you know, take a look at the most powerful players in crypto. Who are they? Just off the top of your head. I would say like Coinbase. Um, you mean like in terms of exchanges? No, the entire player. Like Coinbase is a small player. Coinbase, I think, does... Uh, uh, Coinbase is about one-seventh the size of Binance. Let's put it that way. Oh, Binance. Okay. Yeah. And, 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 and buy true. Right. And Binance is just a single uh, player. The largest players uh, that I can think of would be DCG, Digital Currency Group, under Barry Silva. Okay. He owns a significant amount, but sixty, about 66% of DCG is owned by money center banks such as right. Wells Fargo, Bank of America, etc. Okay, um, Citibank and DCG is the largest investor in the crypto space without a close second. And that really tells you right there what's going on the money backing behind Barry Silbert and Digital Currency Group is the banks themselves. Isn't that interesting? And to understand that Digital Currency Group is invested in somewhere in the north of 300 different projects, including Ripple, in this space. That is very worthy of note right there, uh, I tell you. And no one is a close second. Shout out to Reggie Middleton from Veritoken and Veritisium, again, who has experienced, I believe, the same level of bullying that we see to Library and Ripple. Right here, recent journal article, The Use of Technology Financial Institutions Out of the Democratic Arabic Center notes the National Bank of Egypt use of RippleNet. You can see it right there. The excellent work by Ratha Kahneman here. It shows the original announcement right here on Ripple.com here. You can find it. Really great stuff. We know they have a heavy presence over in the Middle East in general. Now, this is really concerning because the BRICS coalition is building a alternate to SWIFT, taking a page out of the IMF's book with their own type of SDR. Now, imagine now BRICS is bigger than just Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. They're like 19 nations now. It is growing quickly. And that could create a fractionalized zone for payments to happen between those countries, obfuscating SWIFT, its sanctions, and its really antiquated messaging platform at this point. Now, I'm just showing this to you. I'm not going to read this whole article to you, but it says here they may, ver uh, may therefore feel the need to an alternative reserve currency to match something like the IMF's SDR. Now, this is interesting to me because we get into the idea and understanding. If you remember this from 2018, shout out to Digital Nomad Investor who actually got Jim Rickards to respond to him at the time. He said, hello, Jim. Christine Lagarde, who was the IMF managing director at that time, said that she could see a digital asset coupled with the SDR in the future. What is your opinion on that happening? He says it will, but it'll be controlled by the IMF, not a bunch of freelance developers. 
Then there is this exchange that happened. Thanks for your reply, Jim. The company Ripple is working with 40 plus central banks and they're on an IMF task force. So people are saying the digital asset XRP will or will be XRP. He says, people are saying is not my idea of a reliable source. That said, even the IMF needs developers and I'm sure Ripple has some good ones. That doesn't mean XRP will be the reserve asset. More likely it's an EST SDR, an electronic SDR. Now, that is quite a statement right there because I want to first play this clip for you right here where we see in this clip, Jim Rickards talks about what is in fact the best choice when it comes to cryptocurrency and the mechanisms used to power it, whether it's proof of work, proof of stake, or federated Byzantine as is Ripple's XRP ledger. We're going to have a decentralized system that a community can validate, and we don't have to rely on anybody in particular. That was the original idea. So the question is, what's your method of validation? And that's what distinguishes one blockchain from the other. So there's, there, I've listed four of them here, but there are others. Proof of work, that's what blockchain uses. And you know what the work is? You gotta like factor these, you know, uh, 87 digit uh, prime numbers uh, into, or numbers into prime factors. Uh, it's a lot of computer crunching, completely clunky, completely inefficient, non-sustainable. I'll talk about that in a second, but that's Bitcoin. There's something else called proof of stake, meaning you actually, this is what Ether is based on. You demonstrate that you have a certain percentage of the processing power, so you step up based on your stake. There's proof of space. Uh, space is storage space on a hard drive, so I get to vote on the blockchain, I get to vote on validating the blockchain because I've decided to devote a certain amount of my hard drive to that process. That's, there's a new coin called Spacement. Uh, and then there's the Byzantine Agreement, or Byzantine Agreement. Um, there's something, there's a version of that called the Federated Byzantine Agreement, uh, which uh, I uh, personally uh, think is the best. Um. The XRP ledger is different because its core consensus mechanism is different. Um, much and there you have it. So he is citing in this exchange here and then in that conference that he was at, basically that out of the top tokens and projects that are out here, without directly saying it, that the XRP ledger is the solution for such a thing like an ESDR. Pretty powerful stuff. Now, what I want to show you now is this. There is a new BIS report out here, and I want to give this to you. And there is, a first of all, the entire thing is worth reading. It is very powerful. It just came out today, July 2022, and options for access to interoperability of CBDCs and cross-border payments. Now, in this, I just want to show you this, Embridge, project ongoing that aims to build a prototype for a multi-CBDC platform for cross-border payments. Earlier versions of Multibridge uh, have shown that using CBDC arrangement for cross-border payments can be cheaper, faster, and more transparent than today's existing systems. <laughs> The other part that's interesting about this that really jumps out, obviously access to a, a platform as a private distributed ledger technology is achieved by successfully completing onboarding process. The onboarding criteria for each jurisdiction are the responsibility of the corresponding central bank. So you plug into us according to your rules, your guidelines, your regulations. But once you're plugged into that, there is a set of governance and rule book for everyone at that point going forward is what it sounds like. Then you get into here where HSBC, obviously a Ripple partner here, uh, was designed to cover an end-to-end -end transactional life cycle for covering e-bonds. How about that? Yeah, and so, so much more, ladies and gentlemen. It is really hugely positive. But I want to take you to this now. James Wallace, just a short time ago, back in May, telling us exactly that the XRP ledger is really a part of the, what I take from what he's saying, the BIS Embridge model. It is suited for that particular model and project test. And basically, he lays it out right here. Right, it is. It, we're using the same technology that is with the XRP ledger, 
what would the token would be the CBDC, right? So the central bank would actually create their own token, a digital euro, a digital dollar, whatever the mar the market is, um, and that becomes the digital asset. As the so that becomes the digital asset. Keep listening. The native um, coin. The native coin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, where where XRP could come into play potentially is when you're looking at cross border CBDC. So when you have a digital dollar and you have a digital you know, real, you know, or digital digital pound, you, know, you obviously need to have some some way to interact cross border. Yeah. So I think the uh, BIS call this a multi CBDC model. Um, the, the, uh, one of the ideas is you use a sort of a neutral bridge currency to go from one to the other, similar to the model I explained earlier, where at with our on demand liquidity. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the you know, but the core offering really is is not. XR, there's no XRP involved. It's it's the native token is the CBDC. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. He just said it. You know, the the multi-bridge offering right here that it's talking about. And when you go through and read this, it sounds like they're exactly describing how RippleNet and the XRP ledger works. There's no mistake about it. But I want to keep moving here. Because let's go to this right here. This is a reminder that David Morgan, who I promised you would hear from again, shout out to Stansberry Research here. Take a listen to this quick exchange. Orders and mandates come out, uh, and in it there is talk of a coming Federal Reserve digital dollar. No, it's par for the course as far as I am concerned. I mean, how far along they are, I'm not certain. I have looked into this fairly deeply. There is uh, some talk of going on the back of, let's say, an XRP or some other currency that's out there now that's functioning well and has been basically tested, and then putting a CBDC on top of that. Now, think about that for a moment and everything that's just come out. And we see the BIS report coming out. They are not backing down from the idea of bringing all of these CBDC platforms and projects together. There has to be some kind of bridge to work between all of these that can honor not only the different currencies that need to, to be uh, exchanged, settled and all of this, but the rules and jurisdictions that go along with the issuance of these CBDCs. Very important to remember that as well. Now, look, this goes on top of everything that we just talked about. It is the Financial Stability Board. It is where the United States has a great effect on what goes on globally and their contribution to uh, regulations for cryptos and stable coins alike. The International Financial Watchdog Financial Stability Board is planning to recommend global stable coins and crypto rules to the G20 regulators in October of this year, knowing the BAI, BIS has just released a report today. FSB going to release the regulator recommendations in October. We have elections here in the States in November. Will they get something done in coordination by the time the election or just before the elections happen? I don't know, but it is a window to watch out for. And this, talk about something to watch out for. Take a look at this. This is breaking right now with the SEC wants to seal information and in reference to five of its experts that it has put forward. And it puts Ripple in a difficult position here. This is basically the actual filing itself from Jim Filing right here. Shout out to you, Jim, for everything that you do for all of us. Defendants in SEC and brawl over expert reports. SEC is taking the extreme position that the names of its experts and substantive criticism of their reports should be kept from public view. This is just one more tactic to create a delay here. And I don't think anybody could sum it up any better than Jeremy Hogan right here. This case, again, is ass backwards. Listen to what he says here. With the prosecutor SEC attempting to hide everything, normally in these cases, it's the company that wants to hide things from the public. So normally it would be a ripple, the defendant trying to hide all of these things, but instead it's the plaintiff who brought the case to begin with. Judge Torres has shown a slant towards disclosure, so he doesn't think she'll seal what the SEC is hoping for as the way of information for expert reports. We will see, but this is not over by a long shot, ladies and gentlemen. 
There's more to come on this. We will keep you up to date on it. He says the motion is not super clear, but I think this means we will not see any of the motions to strike that will be filed this Tuesday. And I was looking forward to the motion to strike Patrick Duty's expert testimony. So we will have to wait and see what Tuesday yields or not, and then go from there. But that is the latest from uh, everybody in the space. Shout out to everybody who offers so much information and their time to all of this. I appreciate each and every one of you. That's going to do it for me today. Make sure you check out all the links underneath the video. And by the way, if you haven't done it, get your stuff on cold storage, ladies and gentlemen. You could do it with ledger they have great specials and deals and it's a link underneath the video in the comment or description box make sure you check it out i'll catch all of you on the next one not financial advice just my digital perspectives